Hi everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. We are going to be continuing on in Acts. We finished with um, Acts 15, 35 last week, and um, I'm definitely going to be starting at verse 36. Um, but we're, before we do that, I would like us to really take a look at someone that we would be reading about in that section of Acts. A young man named John Mark. We can first probably have some awareness of him, very likely right around Jesus' actual time of crucifixion. There are those who really feel like that it may very well have been um, his family house, maybe like his mother's house, where they actually had the upper room set up for what, what we call now the Last Supper, for the last meal that Jesus had with all of his disciples before he was crucified. So I want to go ahead and look in Mark 14, and I want to read 12 through 16. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. Um, this is a place where they gathered in this upper room. Now, I, there, it doesn't say here in the scripture, but there are those that really think that the young man that carried the water may have been John Mark himself. But um, I think there's even possibly more evidence that this was his home that Jesus used for the Passover. And if we go to the end of Mark 14, and we'll be looking here at verses 50 and 52, there has been some people who have gone with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. We know at least the disciples went, except for Judas Iscariot. And there is a good chance that this instance here may have also been John Mark. I'm going to read 50 through 52. Now this is after the soldiers had come and they arrested Jesus and they were taking him away. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. And because this was included in this account in the book of Mark, there are those that really wonder, you know, if it could have been Mark. He could have just followed them there after they left his home, and he could very well have been the one that, after the disciples had run away, found himself being grabbed by the mob and had to run away, I'm sure quite embarrassed. He was just wearing a tunic. So there's a couple of occasions where we may have already seen John Mark. But if we go now into Acts... Um, we know for sure that this is some place where we're going to definitely see John Mark. Uh, let's go to Acts 12.12. 12. Now, what has happened here in Acts, we've talked about this in our previous studies in Acts, is that Peter had been arrested and an angel had set him free. And he thought at first he was dreaming, but then when he realized, wow, I really am set free, um, it says here that he went to find a bunch of the other believers. So as we look here in Acts 12, I'm going to start with verse 11. We're going to read 11 and 12. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. So here we have Peter going to Mary's house, who was John Mark's mother, and um, the, the, there were many people gathered there, believers gathered there, who were totally surprised to see him and so excited. This was right after Herod Agrippa had um, really started persecuting and um, persecution of the church and, it had, and had had James, John's brother, um, killed. And so when Peter was arrested, he was pretty sure that he was going to be killed. So when, they, when he showed up there after the angel had rescued him, um, everybody there was very excited to, to get to see him. And so I really I really kind of wonder, um, we don't have a lot of evidence of this, but it makes a lot of sense to me that 
that large upper room where Jesus did the Last Supper, um, and then possibility of Mark having followed them out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then we have, um, you know, there's an upper room where there's a room where people are meeting, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Um, there are just several different times when we hear about upper, about places that they gathered together. Um, it could very well have been that it was in Mary, John Mark's mother's house, where the disciples were hiding out. And after Jesus was resurrected, he came to them there. This was a place where they would have known that they could be safe and could be hidden. And so, um, you know, it doesn't sound like the disciples knew John Mark all that much until they went there for the Lord's Supper, for the, the meeting. But it could very well have been that that was a house where they gathered a lot. But we do know for sure that it was Mary, John Mark's mother's house, um, where they were gathered when Peter went to let them know he was okay. And then he wasn't able to stay there. He had to go somewhere else, but he just wanted to reassure them that he was all right. So here we have, you know, some instances where we can begin to see um, some things that happened around John Mark. Now, so when we go, go now in Acts 12, 25, um, we're going to find that Mark now is going to begin to travel with Barnabas and Saul. Um, they had been um, in Jerusalem, and it says here in verse 25 that when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. And so um, we know that um, Mark had gone with them uh, when they returned to Antioch of Syria because the, it says that that's where uh, Barnabas and, and Paul you know, had gone to. So they were there, and so was, was um, John Mark. And so we know now as we go to Acts 13 that Mark went with them on their first missionary journey, the one we've just completed talking about. John Mark went with them. Let's look at Acts 13, and I'm going to read 4 and 5. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. So he's now traveling with um, Paul and Barnabas as they're setting out on their first missionary journey. So he's obviously gotten to be really a part of the church at this point. Well, what ended up happening was that he, for some reason, basically just left them. Um, if we go to Acts 13, 14, and 15, it's talking about, you know, um, Paul now is heading toward Antioch of Pisidia, which is a different Antioch. This is in Pisidia. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamph Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. And then, you know, it goes on to say that Paul and Barnabas traveled inland then to Antioch of Pisidia. This was their first missionary journey. So for whatever reason, after traveling with them for some time here, um, you know, John Mark went back to Jerusalem. He left them. It doesn't say really why, but it just says that he didn't stay with them. Okay, well, now... We are getting ready for Paul and Barnabas to start out on what becomes like the second missionary journey. And um, they, uh, Paul and Barnabas were talking that they felt like they needed to go back and just see how everybody was doing in these churches that they had begun. I want to read Acts 15 now. Now this is our passage in Acts 15 that we are officially at for this tea with Jesus. And I want to go ahead and just finish the chapter. It's going to be Acts 15, 36 through 41. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia, and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. 
Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. So now we have Paul and Barnabas disagreeing now over Mark, over John Mark. To the point where they decided that they wouldn't be traveling together. I think that there's a real good chance that, you know, Paul was a very strong person, very disciplined. And I think that he really felt like that he didn't want to trust John Mark because John Mark had left them before and, and had, they didn't have his assistance along with them. He just left them. So he really didn't want to take him again. Barnabas, who I think was a truly, I don't know, he's called son of encouragement. You know, um, there's just so many things where we've seen Barnabas be very, very kind and um, really probably wanting to give as much of a chance to John Mark as he could. And he wanted to take him along. And I think it was evident that John Mark really wanted to go with them. So they disagreed, and that ended up separating them. And um, so now Barnabas is going to travel with John Mark, and he is sailing for Cyprus. But Paul now is choosing Silas. We've been hearing about Silas as one of the strong Christian um, you know, teachers and, and leaders there. He chose Silas, and then, you know, was left um, entrusted to the Lord's gracious care. And then he began what was going to be now his second big missionary journey. And I'm going to show you the map here. This is the map of Paul's second big journey that he took for missions. And if you notice now, instead of sailing over like to the islands and to Cyprus to go up into, um, you know, the way they had gone before to, you know, to go up to Cilicia and everything, um, this time he stays on the land and he is traveling, if you can see here, from Jerusalem. That He traveled through Syria and you can see him going along past Antioch. Well, you know, Antioch is in Syria there. And then to, to um, Tarsus, Cilicia. So um, he was strengthening the churches all along in that area. And then, of course, we know that he traveled definitely on from there and began another big missionary journey. Okay, so, you know, we have to realize here that Christians can get into disagreements. There can be times when Christians can really disagree about something or feel very differently about something. But, you know, especially in this instance, as we look at it, God did bring something good out of this because now there's two missionary journeys, two teams that are doing missionary work now. There's Barnabas and John Mark, and then, you know, Paul and Silas. And so, um, you know, as Paul goes on his second journey here, you know, Barnabas is setting out also. So God did use, God did work something that was good out of this situation. And we know very well that Paul um, did change his mind about John Mark and began to really trust him again and, you know, um, you know, was willing to really be involved with him again. So I'm sure that this bit of a dispute didn't um, remain any kind of a real problem. I'm sure Paul and Barnabas were, were very, still very dear to each other. And I know that we can look here that Paul very definitely wanted to be, uh, have John Mark in his life again. Um, I want to look at Colossians 4.10. Now, when Paul is writing this letter to the church in, in Colossae, Colossae, anyway, to the Colossians, um, he was in prison and he is giving final instructions and greetings at the end of this letter and here in verse 10 he says Aristarchus who is in prison with me sends you his greetings and so does Mark Barnabas's cousin as you were instructed before make Mark welcome if he comes your way and um, though that's really neat he's now talking about Mark um, being there with him and that you know be good to Mark if he comes to visit you I want to go to Philemon 124. So now Paul is also giving a greeting to um, end this letter, you know, and he says here in verse um, 24, um, well, he has just um, said that, that um, let's look at verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. And then verse 24, so do Mark 
Aristarchus, Dim Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. So we know now that, that Mark is a co-worker with Paul, and so their relationship was quite well restored. And now I want to take a moment also and look at the very last letter that Paul wrote. And we know that this was right before he was uh, martyred, before he was killed. And um, so this was his second letter that he'd written to his beloved Timothy, who was like a son to him. And um, this is so touching to me. It always is every time I read it. Because Paul knew this was like, you know, this, he was going to have to say farewell pretty soon. He knew he was going to die, be killed. And so um, if we look at 2 Timothy 4, 11, it says here, Only Luke is with me. And he, he's talking to Timothy, remember. He says, Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Now he's asking for Mark to please be brought to him when Timothy comes. And um, so I hope Mark could go, could, could go to be with him. You know, it doesn't say for sure, but I hope he could because, um, you know, Paul didn't um, have much longer now to live at this point. All right. Now, we also know that, that Mark, John Mark, became a pretty close associate of Peter. In fact, he kind of became like a son to Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter 5.13. Ah. Uh, your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. You know, um, that's just so neat that he was just, was close, you know, was close to Peter. Um, when they talk about Babylon there, there's a pretty strong evidence that it's really like a symbolic reference to Imperial Rome, which the early church tradition, you know, will associate with Peter and with John Mark. It's very less likely that is going to be referring to a congregation that was actually in Babylon. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, um, Peter is speaking high, very highly of Mark here. Um, there is a man named Papias, P-A-P-I-A-S. Um, he was the bishop of the church at Hierapolis, and that would have been about A.D. 135 to 140. So about, you know, 135 years after Jesus was born. And this Papias described Mark as the interpreter of Peter. And um, this man was also an early witness to the fact that this John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. That he wrote the book, you know, in the Gospels called Mark. It's one of the reasons why when he refers to the young man that was there in the Garden of Gethsemane that, that had to run away, um, that it could very well have been him. Um, because that, that one little reference is put in there, and it could have actually happened to him. So um, this, this Papias is an eyewitness to the fact that John Mark wrote this book. Um, this witness was preserved in something called the Ecc Ecclesiastical History by Eusebius. So there's very strong early evidence that we know Paul really wrote um, that, that, that. There's very strong evidence that we know that Mark wrote the, the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And if we look at when this was written, um, there, there's some things that, that make it pretty easy to determine when Mark wrote it. When it was written after Peter was killed, after Peter was martyred, and um, Nero had Peter killed somewhere around AD 67. And of course, during this same major persecution by Emperor Nero, we know that Paul was also killed. Peter, um, there's strong tradition that he was going to be crucified, and he said he didn't want to be crucified the same way as Jesus because he just wasn't worthy of that. Um, and so he was crucified upside down, is the, the strong tradition. And then you know, that Paul was beheaded. And um, when we look at Mark 13:2. Now, you know, we know that, that Peter was killed right around 67, somewhere in there. And now let's also look at Mark 13, 2. So as we realize that, that Mark was writing this account and, and talking about what Jesus had told them was going to happen, if we look here, they had just, uh, um, the disciples had just been noticing how incredible and impressive the temple was, and it was, you know, very huge building with huge stones. And Jesus replied in verse 2, Yes, look at these great buildings. 
they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. You know, Jesus prophesied that, um, and, you know, that, that that temple was going to be torn down with not even a stone left on top of each other. And that happened in A.D. 70. Rome destroyed the temple. The, the Roman, you know, um, government destroyed the temple. There was so much gold on the temple that when the fire, when, the, when everything was burning there in Jerusalem, um, the gold was melting and seeping down. And so they ripped every single rock, stone apart, the Romans did, to get every speck of the gold that they could. So there was not one stone left on top of another, just like Jesus had said. So if we know that that temple was destroyed in AD 70, and we know that Peter was killed sometime around AD 67, um, and it doesn't look like that this incident in Rome with the temple had happened when Mark was writing the book of Mark, then it looks like that... Um, we can pretty much figure that the book was written somewhere between AD 65 and 70. And um, just right around in there, because we know that Nero began that horrible persecution in 64, and there's somewhere within there that Peter was killed. And they estimate about 67. It could have been in maybe as early as 65. So, um, because you know that temple was destroyed in 70, then um, there's pretty good evidence that that frame, time frame between about 65 and 70 would be where Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. It's not too long, really. It's only like 30-some years after Jesus was crucified and rose again. And, um, you know, Mark had been around for all of that, of course. So um, I'm saying all that because the, the timing of Mark writing the book of Mark oh, is kind of something to me in a way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what was going on during that persecution. I did some research on this and what I found was amazing is that there are absolute first-hand accounts of what happened with this, um, with, with Nero and, and Rome. Um, in the summer of 64, Rome suffered a terrible fire. Okay, it burned for six days and seven nights and consumed, burned up, almost three-quarters of the city. The people were really accusing Emperor Nero for setting this fire, for, for starting this whole thing, claiming he just did it for his own amusement because Nero did really wacky, terrible things sometimes. Um, so he wanted to deflect these accusations, according to what I found here. You know, in order to deflect these accu accusations and, and kind of, you know, settle the people down against him, well, then Nero began to blame the fire on the Christians there in Rome. And um, so then that began a really horrific um, persecution of, um, of the Christians. Now this is quite amazing to me. I'm going to read just a short account to you. Um, this following account was written by the Roman historian Tacitus. He is, I've heard of him before, the Roman historian Tacitus in his book Annals, which was like years. Um, it was published a few years after all this persecution had been going on. Now, Tacitus was a young boy living in Rome during the time of Nero's persecutions. And this is his actual quote. Therefore, to stop the rumor, and then in parentheses they have, that he had set Rome on fire. He, and they're talking about Emperor Nero, okay, falsely charged with guilt and punished with the most fearful tortures, the persons commonly called Christians, who were generally hated for their enormities. This is a Roman writing this. Christus, Christus Jesus, the founder of that name, was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out yet again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, whither all things horrible and disgraceful flow from all quarters as to a common receptacle and where they are encouraged. Accordingly, first those were arrested who confessed they were Christians. Next on their information, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much on the charge of burning the city as of, quote, quote, hating the human race. This does go on then to say that um, the Christians' deaths were made the subject of sport. They were covered with wild beast hides, and then they set, had dogs set on them. 
uh, they would be nailed to crosses. They were set fire to, and when the day was getting dimmer and, and sun going down, um, they would be burned to serve for evening lights. It, it got so bad that eventually compassion rose toward the sufferers, though they were still considered guilty, um, but just the, the stuff Nero was doing was so horrible. Um, I've heard before that um, when they were, you know, put out to be killed by lions or, or killed by wild beasts, it drove Nero nuts because he'd walk around and the faces that he could still sort of see had smiles on them because the Lord was really with the people as they were giving their lives for Jesus. So this was a very, very hard time of persecution. And um, I think it's incredible that we have like a first-hand account by Tacitus of what was going on that time from the Romans perspective. And um, there are people who say, well, you know, how do we know Jesus ever really lived? Well, historically, it is just solid as a rock that Jesus lived and that the things that happened happened. So it was during this time of persecution, you know, which Nero started in 64, and then Rome, you know, destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70. It was during that block of time that Mark wrote his account of the life of Jesus, that he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Um, and, you know, it is one of the four incredibly important accounts that we have that show us what happened during Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. Um, I, Mark, Mark really wanted people to be strengthened and encouraged by Jesus' life, you know, by his example. Now, we got to remember that a lot of people that he was writing to at this time were really under pretty bad persecution. Um, it was, it was a, I think one of the most big intense times of persecution that had begun. And so if we look at, let's look at Mark 8.31. Now these, Mark shares like three accounts in a row here where Jesus was trying to tell them and prepare them for what was going to happen to him. In verse 31 here of Mark 8, then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. So here's Jesus telling them this is going to happen. Chapter 9, 31. Jesus is traveling in Galilee, and he wanted to, sp okay, verse 31, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later he will rise from the dead. And he goes on to say they didn't really understand what he was saying, and they were kind of afraid to ask him what he meant. But he's trying so hard to prepare them. Let's go to chapter 10, and I want to read 32 through 34. They were now on the way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him. He knew this was coming. Flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. He's always referring to himself when he talks about the Son of Man. That was one of the kind of the titles that he, he used uh, about himself. So, you know, what's true for Jesus could be true for any of his followers. Um, let's go back to Mark 8, and let's now look at verses 34 through 38. Then, this is Jesus, and he's going to be speaking. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, and this is out to the, the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? 
If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And, you know, Mark is putting these words in here because what Jesus is saying here is that he's telling them over and over, this is what's going to happen to me. But he also says that my followers may have to take up a cross and follow him. In other words, the followers are going to have to lay their life down in whatever way that means, whether it means just to walk in loving obedience with the Lord and not be selfish um, with their life, to, to want to please him and do what he wants, can also mean really truly suffering for him, laying their life down for him. And he says, what is it going to profit you to, to gain the whole world? but lose your soul. And when we follow Jesus, we will be with him in eternity, no matter what happens to us here on earth. And so, you know, when Mark was writing this specific gospel, there was so much persecution going on. And um, I think he really wanted the ones reading this account, when he wrote it, he wanted them to, to know what the cross of Jesus was going to actually mean. And it's for us too. It's for everybody that has been reading this through all these couple of thousand years, been reading this account. Um, you know, if we can really understand what Jesus' death did for us, if we really understand what his death and resurrection really brought us, then if we do have to suffer for him, We'll understand the value, the meaning that it has. And we will know the hope that we have. Um, this, this, What he suffered brought us hope. And so whether we are able to live a life with little persecution, which many people, like in our culture, you know, have, to, to people who have truly, even in all of these years since and in recent days, truly have, have suffered for him or laid their life down for him, that is meaningful. It has value. There's an eternity here at stake. And, and people who lay their life down for the Lord, who are never ashamed of his gospel, are just trying to tell the world how much they need Jesus. It's an eternal decision. And if someone does lose their life for that, they have the complete, honest, genuine hope. They're just going to go to be with him. They're going to go to an incredible eternity with the Lord. And um, it's, <laughs> it's not a bad thing. And I think that, you know, Mark was just saying over and over again, you know, Jesus said this. And then he talked about how Jesus said, you know, follow me and, and, and take up that cross. Because um, if you deny me here on earth, I will deny you before my Father. But if you won't deny me, no matter what that means, there is glorious, glorious hope. And we know that whenever people have had to suffer for him, the Lord's all, it seems like over and over again, the Lord's truly with people, strengthening them, encouraging them, and sometimes just plain helping them um, to get through whatever it is they're dealing with. And so when I, when I read here in Acts 15, about this dispute that had occurred. You know, this is right where we're at in Acts. I was thinking, well, who is this John Mark that was the, the real cause of all of this, um, you know, the dispute that, that Paul and Barnabas had? And I think I found a young man who had, you know, kind of watched from the outside, possibly Jesus actually being arrested and had run off in terror when then the mob grabbed him and he had run off naked, all embarrassed and, and frightened. And, and I don't know what happened where he left Paul and Barnabas. Maybe that whole thing became overwhelming for him. I don't know why he left. There must not have been a really obvious thing calling him home or it wouldn't have upset Paul. But it's like he just, maybe he just couldn't handle what was going to really be needed here. But man, it, he ends up being a, a tremendous help to Paul, a tremendous help to Peter that we know of from Scripture. And in the midst of persecution, he wrote this wonderful account, um, bringing to life, you know, the life that, that Jesus lived. And um, 
we are pretty sure from like good strong um, um, you know it's not in the Bible but a lot of times there's other sources that can talk about what happened to people from you know just the tradition um, that's been passed down for so many years um, it, which is why we're pretty sure Paul was beheaded and that Peter was crucified upside down um, there was no doubt whatsoever that they were martyred um, this John Mark did die a martyr's death also um, the strongest tradition says that he was in an area where they were very angry with him because people were um, he was trying to get them to stop the idol worship in order to worship Jesus and so they put a rope around his neck and drug him until he was dead and um, I know that just as with Stephen being stoned, um, just as with so many of those who gave their life for Jesus, and so many who are giving their life now for Jesus, that the Lord is with them as they're laying their life down. Stephen looked right up and said, I see him standing there. Jesus was going to welcome him home. So I know that when John Mark lost his life that way, he went straight into glory and straight to be with his Lord. And so I just found his life to be very interesting to me with everything that we can see from actual scripture and then from um, knowing that he did write the book of Mark and just from some strong um, historical tradition, especially about what was going on with Nero's persecution of the Christians. So um, I just, I want us all, it just seems like um, that as I go through Acts, we have to talk a lot about this, the strength that the Lord gave to his followers as they boldly proclaimed the truth of Jesus, as they truly shared the gospel. And I find myself so challenged to not back down in any way that people need to know the truth, that they are lost without him, and that they're believing a lie. You know, so many times now in our world, people just say the truth is whatever you want it to be. The truth is whatever it is to you. It, it, it's, it's however you approach it to the point where there was movies that would say that whatever happens after you die is just up to whatever you want it to be. Well, I, I'm sorry, but the, the fact is that real is real. Genuine is genuine. Um, the truth about things can't be just whatever different people want to say it is. And so if we're going to come to facing whatever happens to us after we die, I want us to know the truth. And um, there are so many people, so many people who saw Jesus resurrected, who gave their life because they know, they knew it to be true, including his own half-brothers. They knew it was true because they saw him resurrected. And... Um, I want us to live a life shining with the truth of who Jesus is and how much people need him and not being afraid of whatever that cost is going to be. And um, as I've looked in here in Acts, it just keeps coming back to that. Let's stand for him and know that there are people right now in this world who are laying their lives down because they will not stop saying the truth, trying to bring light where there's darkness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you put the, the message into John Mark's heart and mind for him to write the book of Mark. All four of those gospels, Lord, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are so powerful and so important. And I thank you that we have them, how you've protected it for so many centuries so that we have your word and we can know you and know what happened and know what Jesus' death meant and know why he came and, and know what happened in this world after he came and, and died and was resurrected. What was this that brought about such an incredible change in people's lives? We can understand it because you've protected this word for us. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that in every different life and heart, they could possibly be hearing this, or in the, in the lives of people that, that are around those that can hear this. My prayer, Lord, is that we will all joyfully stand strong for you, no matter what that is ever going to mean, that we're not afraid 
to say that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That we will not be ever ashamed of your name or of your gospel. Because your name is the power. You are the power of salvation that this world needs. You're not just one of the religions. Jesus, God the Son, you came to us. Oh, thank you. You are the only way, Lord. I, I pray we can just proclaim that. And Lord, I just, I pray that you will help your love to just pour into so many people's lives so that it will cast out fear. More than anything, I just want people to know you're right there with them and that they can ask you and you hear them and you care and you respond. Lord, I pray that we will just believe you and have a thankful heart remembering what you've done. And Lord, I pray that this election coming up will be an honest one. I, don't, I just want to keep praying that, that there can be an honest representation of the people. And Lord, we want to pray for our leaders. And Lord, I pray for them. I pray for our leaders and their families. And I pray that you will be sovereign. And Lord, let us respond to everybody with the kind of love and forgiveness that you show. Proclaiming the truth, but loving people who need to hear it. Oh Lord, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to include my little thing here that tells you about our church online in case you'd like to be able to share there. I do want to take a moment here and invite you, if you don't have a church where you're already enjoying online services, or if you'd like to have more worship and more of God's Word, um, to just invite you to our church. It's called Compassion Church. The service is presented live um, on Sunday at 10 in the morning Eastern Time. And you're welcome to watch it as it's being presented premiere live during that time. You can actually interact live. Or if you'd like to wait till later or a different time, it'll be on YouTube and you can watch it anytime that you like. And I will be putting a link in the description below. I'll be putting a link on the end screen. And I just wanted to invite you. I wanted you to have one more opportunity to have a place where you can have some good worship and hear God's word. So I just... I don't want anybody to not have some way that they can really be getting fed and um, interact with people during this time. So I just wanted to invite you. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming with me today as I've we've talked about the life of the man who wrote the book of Mark, as much as I could find out about him. Listen, love you guys, and I will see you later. Be blessed.